uh, manager of the Indians, Terry Francona, we call him Tito, joins us. Uh, uh, Skip, well, how are you? Good, Mike. How are you? Good, thank you. Appreciate a couple of minutes uh, now that the season has wound down. First up, let's talk about uh, your old pitching coach as he takes over the Mets, which is uh, quite an undertaking right now. Tell the audience, Tito, about Mickey Calloway. Well, I'll tell you what. The Mets fans are lucky. He is, you, they, you got a special one. I mean, he he... I didn't know him coming into the job with the Indians, and his um, his uh, his level of expertise, his amount of confidence, it, it far surpassed his years of experience. And he's going to be a really good manager. He's his confidence. He he knows how to talk to players. Um, he's got a really good feel for people. He's going to be really good. I, you know, when you have good people like that, you know you're going to lose them, and it hurts because you got to replace them. But he's going to he's going to be really good. I know that you. He's a fun guy to be around. You know, I know that you, uh, you know, were in his corner. I heard you were a big influence, obviously, and you know, banging the drum for him. And it certainly didn't hurt to have uh, you in in his corner and. Uh, uh, Tito is up for the uh, manager of the year tonight. They'll announce the award tonight. Not that he needs to win it again. He's the best manager in baseball. And it was a great season. Um, before I get to your season, back to him for a second. What is the, I mean, what is, if he has a philosophy taken over this injury-riddled but talented Mets staff, what is the Callaway pitching philosophy in a nutshell? Well, you know what, that's going to be interesting because, you know, he's not going to be the pitching coach. But he certainly has a you know a tremendous background in pitching. Um, I know with our guys, he felt like if you had the stuff, which certainly those guys with the Mets do, you know, you you attack the strike zone, you you don't shy away from contact, you know, you you work ahead, you know, the O O for strike one, one one when you have a chance to swing the count in your favor, those are huge. Um, identifying your best breaking ball and being able to go to that when you're in a bind as opposed to having five pitchers, five pitches and maybe three, you're not sure where they're going and you start to guess. Identify what it is and go to it. Um, he, he's so good about, because he's confident in himself because he's prepared and I think it, 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 that gets passed along to the pitchers. You know, I've watched you in the room through the years, from the days of when you were three down to the Yankees in the postseason in those press conferences. You've been a master at those press conferences. How? What, what advice would you give him, or what is going to be his strength of dealing with the media here in this big city? You know what? I think he just got to be himself. He's got a really outgoing personality. Um, I, I don't ever feel, Mike, like, you know, I think some guys butt heads with the media, and I certainly have at times, but I, I think the media has a job to do, and I hope I've always respected that. I, I don't mind when guys ask me tough questions, because if I don't have an answer, shame on me. And I'd much rather somebody ask me than not ask me and then hammer me for doing something. My goodness, just go ahead and ask me. Like I said, if I don't have an answer, shame on me. You know, you come from, uh, you know, the only guy in history to take a team. And I remember, I, 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 this has always stuck in my head, you in the media room when you were down 3-0 after the Yankees had won that third game, 19-8, listening to you in the media room before game four, and the way you talked about how your team would address game four. And there you were, in a, you know, losing late in that game, and you come back to win it. We all know what happened the next couple of days as you pulled off the uh four games and beat the Yankees in that classic series. Um, you had the tables turned on you a little bit this year. I mean, I'm sure it went through your head. Here I was, and this year now you're up 2-0. You're here, and, you know, if Lindor's ball goes out of the ballpark, I mean, there's so many ifs and so many little things when, you know, your guy pitched an incredible game that night, and he, they judge brings back the two-run home run and all the little things. I mean, you've been on both sides now, so you know that you've experienced it. How about this year, especially after the incredible run you guys had coming into the playoffs? Yeah, you know what, Mike, and I, I say this all the time: the season doesn't wind down; it comes to a crashing halt, and no more so than this year. I mean, we go into the playoffs feeling really good about ourselves. We we win the first two games somehow. We won that second game. I'm still not sure how, and then we can't find a way to win that third game. 
you know, we, we, we were very uncharacteristically, you know, we didn't catch the ball. Um, some of the guys that had hit for us all year didn't. Yep. You know, if you'd have told me that in two games Kluber would go a total of four innings, well, I would you know, what never about have, it? You know. Now, listen, you guys have been very stand-up about this. Was he hurt? No, I don't, I don't think so. I think he was, I, he was losing his arm slot. Um, I think at that point in the year with every pitcher, they're going to feel something. You know, if you took every guy out that felt something, you'd have a heck of a time to field the team. I mean, I think people forget, you know, in what, two and two-thirds, he had six strikeouts. He just wasn't locating, and it was flat, and he was having a heck of a time. You know, it's, it's that time of the year where you can't let somebody sit out there and figure it out. If it's July, you, we'll let him sit out there and figure it out, and he will. It's just, you know, when, you, when you're down to one game and you go home, you can't really do that. And then you get the mysteries of October. Your guy Ramirez had an incredible year. He couldn't buy a hit in a big spot. Guys on base, guys on third. I know. I mean, he couldn't buy it, a hit in the postseason. You know what, Mike? If you had to pick one guy that's going to be able to hit good pitching, it's Jose because he puts the bat on the ball. He hits the ball to all fields. But they did a number on him. They kept you know him and Lindor. They kept him down. You got to sometimes you got to give the other team a little credit. Yeah. They. They did a number on us, and you know, like I said, we were probably fortunate to win the second game, or the series oh, no might question. not have gone fine. Yeah, I mean, shoot, we didn't we didn't do a lot of things good in the series. That's what that's what kind of hurt. You know, it's amazing though. People try to prepare teams for to, for the season, for the postseason. Your team, which had been to the World Series last year, has one of the incredible runs of all time. One of the most dominant winning streak runs. I mean, you trailed like five, ten innings the whole winning streak. I mean, you guys were amazing in that record-breaking streak. You guys come in a powerhouse and can't find one win down up 2-0 in a series. It shows you how unpredictable postseason baseball is. It is, and you know what? It's part of it's part of why I love the game. It's part of why also once we lost, it was so hard to watch the rest of of the playoffs because I couldn't find a way to watch every team lose. I couldn't figure that out. <laughs> you know, you're so you're so mad, you're so jealous because you want to keep playing. And 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 I actually did turn on some games because they were so good. But it just it hurts. I mean, there's no getting around it. It 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 it, it physically hurts when you don't win, and it's hard to it's hard to put it out of your mind. It, I was I was probably the happiest guy when baseball was over because I knew nobody else was playing anymore. You know, your team had a great season. Houston had a great season. The Yankees and everyone knew the Yankees were dangerous when they got to the postseason, and you knew it. They everybody knew it, and how close you know how good that team could get. And once they got some pitching, you knew they could be very tough and came with it in the eyelash of going to the World Series. I mean, they played great, and that Houston team really had a heck of a year. They really did. They did. They did. And I think I think if you're a Yankees fan right now, you got to be really happy because. I mean, they've got young, athletic players. They have the resources when they want to spend that they can. I think Brian Cashman, I think he's – I've been watching him forever because I was with the Red Sox for so long. He does a really good job. And when he says he's going to change managers, he has a reason. And if there's anybody out there that I would trust, it'd be Brian Cashman. You know, it's funny. You won 95 – we're talking with Tito Francona, the Indian manager. You – won 95 games a year and two World Series in Boston where they hadn't won in 80 years. And you know what? Finally went on your way. Ten years is a long time anywhere. So to me, you know, if you're 10 years, it doesn't matter how much you win, they can change. We know Joe Girardi's a good manager. But ten years, they can change a manager. I mean, it's not, you know, listen, 10 it, years is a long time. It is, Mike. And you know what? It, it, it sometimes... Your your voice sometimes maybe they just need to change the voice because you're telling people things over and over and over and I do think at times you start to become stubborn and and you know sometimes it's it's time to move on that's just the way it is and I've always said it's it's not just a team's right I mean it's it's not their, it's their obligation to get the manager they want and if it's not me then you know what. God bless them, and you know I'll move on. It's, but they have that right to to get who they think is best for their organization. The, can you get to a point, or have you gotten to a point yet, where you get past the postseason disappointment and dwell on some of the amazing things your team did in the regular season this year? Yeah, well, it helped when everybody was done playing for sure. 
um, because it was hard. You know, every year you just don't know how you're going to feel. I mean, last year I was so proud of our guys, and that really won out. Um, this year it hurt. It was hard. I mean, it was pretty raw for a while. But but now that baseball's done, you know, you start calling guys and checking in on them, and you start thinking about okay, how can we how can we come back next year? But this one hurt a little bit. There's no getting around it. What is the – how much has it changed? You know, people talk now about the relationship with the front office and the manager, the analytics and all that stuff that that is such a part of baseball now and how much of that is forced on the manager. As a guy who is considered one of the, without question, great managers in the sport, how do you deal with the balance? How about, now you have a young general manager who we know very well from here, uh, our program director's son, uh, but you have a partnership and you're also at the top of the sport, but how about a manager dealing with the front office, dealing with the analysis, dealing with all the information now? Well, I think it can be different depending on who the people are. I know in our situation, the guys are really good about getting me what I want and putting it in a in a way that I can understand it and use it. Because you can have all the numbers in the world, and if you don't understand it, it's certainly not going to be applicable. But they've been great about that. They know the things that I'm hungry for. And again, you know, what it is is I just don't want to guess. You know, I like to have the information, and it can be in a number of different ways, whether it's on a video, you know, it could be on paper, it can be with your eyes, and you certainly have an obligation to know your own guys. But I just feel better. I feel more prepared when I know what the numbers say. It doesn't necessarily mean we're always going to do it, but I just feel better prepared. Is the game going to stay strikeout home run? Is it going to stay as strikeout home run dominant as it's become? I hope, I, I hope not, Mike. You know what? I, I, I find myself, you know, sometimes we move our defenses – with guys with two strikes, and I look up and I'm like, why are we even moving our defense? Because the hitters <laughs> hitters aren't changing anything. They're not shortening up. They're not putting the ball in play. Um, I guess that's probably why Brantley and Ramirez, you know, I'm so fond of them because they're, they're kind of a throwback. They put the ball in play. They use the whole field. That's why they hit 300. You know, do you, I mean, do you, as a manager, I mean, do you, do you get upset when there's that? I mean, now, your team – Led the you you guys struck out more guys and wore fewer guys than than any yeah. team almost in history this year. I think it was that close. Yeah. I mean, so and the numbers were overwhelming. But I mean, you see so many like let's use the Yankees as an example. They strike out so much. They hit a lot of home runs, but they strike out so much. Do you look at the home run at the strikeout at all as a non productive out, or do you not worry about that anymore? Well, it depends. I mean, if you got a bunch of home run hitters that, you know, that's going to be how you score your runs. Um, I think it comes down to what kind of team you have. Um, I personally love the fact of, of guys that can put the ball in play. They can get a line moving. They can keep it moving. You know, you can go first to third. That way, if you have guys that are good base runners, you can win games maybe that you're not supposed to. Um, you know, it, it, but, but you got to take what, what you have. You know, ultimately, we got to score runs. How you get to that, can be done a lot of different ways. So again, you got to take your personnel and then try to get the good and stay away from the not so good. Bruce had a Bruce who we know here with the Mets had a very good year for you guys. He really fit in well, didn't he? He did a good job. He did a really good job of coming in in midseason and being a part of our team. And he said that you know it wasn't the first time he had done that, so it was a lot easier this time around. But he's a good kid, I and mean, he's a potent bat. I mean, you put him behind Encarnacion or Santana, and he, he really does a good job driving in runs. I know you don't make excuses. How much did the Encarnacion injury hurt you guys? Well, it, you know what it did? It was a couple things. One, losing Edwin is big, but we also went into the playoffs. We were going to play uh, Urshela at third, and the idea was to have great defense, and we could pinch hit when we wanted to. Well, then when Brantley all of a sudden is our DH, we lost our pinch hitter, too. And so it, it just a, a number of things didn't work the way right. we envisioned it, and it, it didn't help us by by any stretch of the imagination. Plus, you guys amazingly didn't catch the ball in the postseason. You really didn't. No, I mean, we were, team, you're you right. Catch you're the right. Ball. We we were a really good defensive team 
from the from about June on, and we stepped all over ourselves in the playoffs. We we were so uncharacteristic the way we caught the ball. It was really disappointing. You know, I've seen that happen, though, to the top Yankee teams, too, where sometimes the playoffs you just don't get, you know, things don't break right. It, I mean, you've seen it a million times with teams. I've seen it with great Oriole teams, great A's teams, Yankee teams. It happens a lot where teams can have great Great regular seasons and just be bad for three or four days and you're gone. Well, and that's exactly right. And, boy, I'll tell you what, though, it hurts. And there's no getting around it. And You know, you try to figure out, okay, what can we do different? But October baseball is really special. And it's not always the best team. It's the team that plays the best. And it's it, it same thing that will make you laugh makes you cry. So, again, you just keep fighting. You try to put yourself in that position enough times where you can break through. We're talking with Cleveland manager Tito Francona, who has broken through more than once, obviously. He's won championships a couple of times, been to the World Series on three different occasions, and is up for the manager of the year this year. And his ex-pitching coach is now the uh, new manager of the Mets, and Mickey Calloway. Um, when you, when you uh, deal with this kind of disappointment, or any year, how much time do you, when the season ends for a manager, and you've lived this every day, how long before it's next year and you're chomping at the bid and you're thinking about your team every day, how much time do you, is downtime? Is it the holidays? Is it uh, January 1st? Is it you got to get into it a little bit in the winter when you have the winter meetings. But other than that, how much is it before it's day-to-day again for you with your team? Mike, it takes me a little bit longer every year. Just, you know, as I get a little bit older and, and the season takes more out of you, it takes a little longer to recharge, but when it does, I'm good to go. Like I get around, you know, you get to the winter meetings and you start talking baseball and then you get through the holidays and then here comes, you know, January and I get that itch and I can't wait to get to spring training. You know, spring training starts uh, February 14th. I get up there February 1st because I want to get there. That's never changed. It just takes a little more out of me every year as I get older. Well, listen, it was a tremendous season. The winning streak was unbelievable. It really was. And uh, you guys have a heck of a team coming back, so it's going to be fun. I mean, you, the Astros, the Yankees, I mean, the American League's got some, Red Sox got some really good teams right now. It's going to be fun next year. It will be. And, you know, we haven't even started a free agency yet, so it's going to be, it'll be a fun winter, and then it'll be fun to to get back at, you know, to baseball and see how good we could be because, I'm fortunate. I, the people I do it with, the players I'm allowed to be with, I, I love them to death. And it doesn't mean we don't have disappointments, but it sure is a fun environment to be around. Thanks very much. Talk to you again. Thank you. Mike, good luck to you. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you. All right. Tito Francona, he's up for the award tonight. Who else is up for the award tonight? Let's see. Who would win it? Francona, he might win it. I mean, they won all those games in a row. You know, Molitor should win it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Frank Conan's probably won it a bunch of times. He could win it. But, I mean, yeah, Molitor should win I give it to Molitor. Yeah, he had a – Molitor won, should have won 65 games. What did he win? I give it to Molitor. I mean, Molitor just, he did an amazing job with that team. He really did. A remarkable job with that team. He was supposed to win, like, 68 games. Um so there you go as far as uh, everything going on with him and, again, with uh, Callaway, who he uh, readily endorses and, and was a pretty big factor – my understanding, really behind the scenes and really banging the drum for him to get the job. I mean, uh, he really uh, was a big endorsed, heavily endorsed his uh, pitching coach to get the job as manager. Back at. 